So I'm still waiting for some parts to get the um, doors in. Um, the remaining glass bits, I've got some screws and stuff I'm picking up in a couple of days. So I've been working on a few wiring refinements. And um, let me just turn this thing on. So basically, uh, two things. One, when I was uh, keying the start, I had to turn the motor over. The digital display was resetting because the voltage was dropping too low for the display. So I've changed the wiring around, added a capacitor and an inductor and a diode, and now I can put the, uh, I've got the thing on kill so it won't start, and I can, and it won't, uh, won't be bad anymore, it doesn't, doesn't reset anymore, which is good. The other thing is, when you put on the headlights, so I'll turn the headlights on, um, neither the original stock or the male replacement stock would uh, stay if I put the thing, click it into high beams, so now I got the high beams on and go back to low beams, it wouldn't stay on. And um, what I ended up doing is putting a little gasket between the two sandwiched layers of, of the switch stocks. Just a little gasket on this side, uh, up above and below where the high beam stock is. Um, just a, an eighth of an inch of spacing and it basically puts a, a little more tension and allows the, uh, when you pull the stock, it'll actually hold the switch up. And then when you push the stock back down, it'll, it'll pop it back down. So. That was annoying me, not being able to leave the thing on high, so I go whipping down the highway and keep it on high, that kind of thing, and then being able to bring her down and also be able to just flash it uh, briefly if someone's coming at you with their high beams on. So anyway, that is all she wrote for this, and uh, I will be working on a few other things in the next couple of days while I'm waiting for that uh, remaining electrical mechanism stuff. Yeah, so I'm upgrading to this larger thermal expansion valve, so it's um, a 2.1 kilowatt versus the 1 kilowatt um, that I've currently got in because I'm pretty sure that the expansion valve is undersized relative to the compressor, so I'll find out. Um, the nice thing is it's got 3 eighths in and half inch out versus quarter inch in, 3 eighths out, so the number 8 um, you know, male insert o-ring will just, I can just epoxy it in, it's loose, that's fine, it just, epoxy will fill the gap, same thing here, so I'm just going to epoxy it up and then I can plunk it in the car and try it. Well I've um, finished installing the mechanisms, this is the Mark II window lift, I still had to slot this hole and this hole, for whatever reason, they didn't line up with the Mark II, um, the, the, the channel, or the, the, the lifter channel, as well as the uh, electric mechanism. But um, this is parallel exactly to this, just measure down with the tape measure and, and get it so that it's exactly parallel. And then this runs um, the exact same way the old one did. Um, which is aligned with the outside edge of the door here, parallel. So I've just gone to uh, ground off some, some um, bolts so that they're lower profile. And then these ones you don't need to worry about because they're in a recess. So it's basically where the holes are, drops in. And then as I've told you before, I've ground away behind so that I can um, there's some rubber as well in behind here and some adhesive so this is all held in place firmly and uh, the connectors on there one is the power coming from the panel and the other is the motor and then I'll show you my my switch in a second so this is my madness I've taken the um, mechanical lifter mechanism and just cut it off and then made a switch out of it so the back of the lifter mechanism comes through and there's a lever arm so it'll swing up and down and then all I've used is some um, braided copper uh, wick you know solder wick and I've just 
use contact cement to glue it to a plastic um, lever and then I've done the same thing on the tops and bottoms and with, with foam so there's metal brackets here that have just been adhesively attached uh, with um, epoxy and when this lever moves it will contact so it swings up swings down it reverses the switches so it just reverses the power so I've got um, foam acting as a spring so the lever presses against this foam and then it presses these contacts together and the reason why these contacts are mounted to foam is just for tolerances purposes in case I get to a point where um, you know this this isn't exactly parallel one side's touching but the other isn't so anyway this seems to work quite well I'll hook it up I'll show it to you in a sec um, and we'll uh, take a first spin Okay, so put the handle down, put the handle up, that's what I wanted, I'm happy. So I'll just have to hook the glass, which is in, into the channel and give it a whirl next. It takes a little while for the window to seat in and not be too stiff. It's really stiff right now, but uh, so there's the bottom and back up and then it's just it's very slow at the very top but it'll it'll go in it goes in all the way but it's just it's very tight right now and I've noticed between last night and today it's already loosened up somewhat so it takes a little while once you've got all the surround bits in so um, yeah instead of using the rubber in the bottom by the way so I'll lower it down here I've run a couple of pieces of tape inside to take up some of the slack with the metal and then a bit more duct tape on the outside rather than hammering in a bunch of rubber it's really really stiff I don't want to break the glass and uh, want to be able to get it in and out if I have to adjust it at all so I've decided not to um, jam the rubber in there and then not be able to remove it very easily. It's very difficult to that to rubber if you bang it in there, getting it back off is a bitch. So still needed some tuning time on this thing. But there you go. That's uh, what I wanted to show you. Well, the windows continue to go up and down easier and easier as the uh, they have a chance to settle in. Um, I took this the switches out. And I've put something called a, um, a Zener diode, which is a very high frequency or very fast switching diode. Um, you put it in reverse, so the, um, it's to capture what's called the back EMF from the motor. So it turns out when you stall the motor so you get to the high limit or low limit, it'll take up to like 25, 30 amps. So it's normally around 10 amps. Clamps to about 15, 16 when it gets close to the top of the window and it's struggling a bit. When it hits the top of the window, it'll surge up to about 30 in the stall position, which is fine. Then you just you know, take your finger off the um, off the switch. But then you've got 30 amps of current in the motor that has nowhere to go. They think of it as like a, a vehicle with momentum. Well, the electrons in the winding, the inductors, the winding of the motor, want to keep moving. And so as you release the switch, you get a big spark. And there's a couple things wrong with that. One, it's very, very hard in the electronics of the car um, to have surges like that, especially with computers, so I don't like that. Two, uh, you'll eventually arc out and damage the contacts and the switches. So what this um, diode does, it's I'm putting it in with the uh, connector uh, to the motor, is um, it'll give the, a path for that uh, electricity to um, to discharge within the motor itself and um, I use this with all of my pulse with modulated fans and uh, this is a good strategy for, for switching any inductive load so this is a fairly high uh, current rating diode hopefully this will not be damaged by the surge so we'll see but uh, I'm putting it in so yeah I'm pretty much getting to the final Getting the original glass back in and the Lexan, all my Lexan panels down there, out of the car. Um, 
just want to make a comment about this. I've uh, had a real bitch of a time trying to get that in. Five attempts, all failures until I profiled the edges of the glass. Now, obviously the glass was originally in there, so <coughs> it's just that I'm not capable of sucking it into place. But um, the edges here are, are flat and somewhat rough, depending on where, where you feel on this. And so what I do is I just 120 grit uh, um, belt and I just profile and it takes about, I don't know, half an hour and you go all the way around and you completely round this edge off. So you sort of knock a 45 on it everywhere uh, until it's sort of a sharp point or close to being a sharp point and then you round it all off. So you're actually, I'm pulling back to the maybe a millimeter or two max maybe the corners two millimeters and around here less than a mill and then <coughs> rounding it all off again and I use a hand sander uh, to, to finish it so this sort of roughs it in knocks all the edges off smooths it around and then I, you can tell right away when you when you have one person holding the glass in place and then I'm inside with the ropes and you can tell right away if it's a problem because you can't even get the glass to set in even part way. You should be able to press this thing in and have it basically butt up against the pinch weld with a bit of force, obviously. <clears throat> and then, then you have a chance of actually sucking it into place when you remove the ropes. But uh, if you can't even get it to set firmly in place with uh, you know some Windex uh, as lubricant, then you've Got to use my trick here. So I'm plugged in the new um, thermal expansion valve with double the capacity of the old one, and I'm uh, charging it. And uh, charging it slowly, I find that if I dump liquid refrigerant into the system, it kind of throws it off and gets quite unstable. And what I'm trying to do is get a couple of numbers here. Uh, you may or may not be able to read this stuff, but basically right there it is. So, what the key key numbers are, the thermal expansion valve output to the evaporator output. And that's the superheat value. So what goes in the evaporator is minus one Celsius. And what comes out is plus five Celsius right now. And I'm looking to optimize that at different compressor speeds. So right now I have the compressor on a mid-range mid speed and it's pulling 20 something amps. It says minus 18 here but I'm also running a um, 10 amp charger so it's like minus 28 and uh, bottom line is um, you know as a mid middle setting here it's, it's with about a 6 degree superheat number and uh, you know blower is on sort of medium low. So if I turn the blower up it'll suck more heat out of the evaporator and uh, you'll end up with um, uh, a bigger spread between the input and the output. Um, so I'm just trying to optimize the efficiency by, by playing playing slowly, filling the system with the uh, refrigerant and just watching the performance. And uh, now we've dropped, the superheat is now dropped to four. So this is, for me it's better. You want, I, I would love it to be coming out nice and cool as well, and uh, the more refrigerant that's in the system, the more it can um, continue evaporating. And uh, I'd like to have a superheat actually around three degrees, three or four degrees. So we're getting, we're getting close. So that's kind of what I'm doing. All the glasses in the car. Whoa, hello. Come back. Oh, there. All the glasses in the car, and it goes in in 24 hours for its road test again. Hopefully this time it'll pass. I'm sure it will. So here's my windshield wiper fluid, I guess, pump and uh, mounting idea. So I built a flange off of this mount to attach to the back of the, uh, what's basically a Tums antacid container. And it uh, holds about a half a liter, it's pretty good, or maybe, yeah, about a half a liter. It's more than enough for what I need. And um, then there's a little Mugen pump and uh, it runs through and then 
up to the, the uh, nozzle. So I'm ready to go with this thing now. Everything's done. It's going in for its road test again tomorrow. And if all goes well, it'll be permanently licensed and I can start driving it and testing it properly. There it is. I have my permanent license. So I can now. So, by the way, it's kind of funny. I'm jacking this up just to check a few things. And uh, when you lift the front up with the suspension and the uh, stiffness of the frame, the wheels are like way off the ground on both sides. It just lifts the car up and flips it sideways. It's kind of funny. Well, well, maybe you can see the dirt. I've just driven this thing for an hour and a half out in the dark. Didn't want to mount the camera and do all that kind of stuff. That's my first time really sorting out the car. So it basically has zero body roll when it uh, you just like this, it's flat. And uh, first gear, it'll uh, shred the tires. As soon as your RPMs are above 4,000, it'll, it'll just spin them in first gear, which is awesome actually. Um, doesn't seem to like revving above 7,700 RPM. And maybe it's just, I gotta tune a few things in the engine. It, to, pulls like crazy up to about 7200 RPM and then it seems to get a little lazier above that. I'm, I, I'll get like the accelerometers working and I'll actually start mapping this out to see where it is but it uh, really seems to produce its peak torque uh, in the engine about 5500 RPM and then its peak horsepower I'm, I'm guessing right now is going to be between 7 and 75 in that range maybe 7300. Uh, I'm just guessing but it feels like that's where the sweet spot is. So that was the debate with this, this, this thing because you know it's a big stroker, 95.5 millimeter uh, stroker crank in this thing and uh, throws the rod stroke ratio off a little bit. Maybe it doesn't like revving, but it's gonna produce a lot more mid-range grunt with the, uh, with the stroke and the displacement. So we'll, uh, we'll just have to see how this thing benches out. But uh, the car, starting to really like it. I don't think the suspension is actually too stiff. So uh, it's coming together as a nice package. Really, really fast car, really aggressive, really like a go-kart. So even with the, the 185, 60, 14 tires, it's got lots of, lots of grip with these uh, Dereza 2 uh, rubber on it. Well, I drove this for another hour tonight, so for a total of three hours. And uh, the thing that bothered me was that um, I've always had sort of a smelly exhaust, and uh, it's. Uh, I'm just gonna pull the spark plug now. Look at them, but uh, let me just stick my finger down here in the exhaust plate to show you. It's, it's um, a little bit of blue smoke occasionally, and that does not look good. That's uh, the oily exhaust. I'm wondering whether or not my rings didn't seat properly. Spent too much time trying to tune the computer at the beginning with the thing idling and never really had the opportunity to sort of you know start it up and drive it right I didn't have the ability to drive the car for our first several hours of running the engine I tried to use the the brakes to load the engine somewhat to seat the rings but it's one idea is that the rings aren't seating I may have to pull the heads and have a look pull the head off and have a look um, so uh, Mm. The other thing is, I blew the alternator tonight. The alternator is dead, um, and it's super hot. So this little Denso racing alternator is just baking hot, and that's not putting out any voltage. It's gone, gone away. I'm not quite sure what's going on there. I'm going to have to replace it, but I have a circuit that feeds it higher than the actual output voltage so that it'll not overcharge the lithium battery and um, that may be that circuit may be uh, burning out the regulator um, not exactly sure I'm gonna have to think about that so for instance when the alternator is putting out 13.7 volts I'm telling the alternator it's putting out 14 and a half so it won't keep charging the system because I don't want 14 and a half volts so it'll kill the uh, kill the lithium battery if it stays there forever it likes to be around 13.5 so yeah uh, first day of having it licensed and driving it and I'm going it's burning oil and smelly and um, 
then the alternator dies. So, ha ha ha, got some work to do. Well, the plugs are looking clean. So, hmm, I have to think about that a bit. And so, what I'm doing here is I'm basically having a go at um, a microscope view. So that's the cylinder wall. And I can, I have my little camera, I'll pull it out for a sec. So this is a little camera with a right angle uh, piece on it. And um, so what I'll do is I'll drop it down in the hole. Here we are going past the uh, spark plug uh, and then um, you can see the valve and I spin it around I'm just sort of looking at the top you know the interface between the cylinder head and the uh, block and then you go down a little deeper and start looking at the walls of the cylinder so the spin it around and um, I'm getting a little far away from from it on the this let's see I should be right in the center but um hello anyway I'm having struggling a little bit on the cylinder here maybe I can turn up the brightness oh no there it is so it doesn't look too bad this is shiny I'll do the next one Let's see if I can get it in the hole. There we go. Dropping down the interface. Now there is what looks like oil right there. See it? So it looks like we have a leak. Maybe um, that oil is coming from, who knows where it's coming from, but maybe it's coming from above. Maybe it's coming from uh, the head gasket leaking. So this again, the cylinder walls look good. But in this case, cylinder number two, I'm seeing a little bit of oil right there. Only well, it's wet, and um, I'm not quite sure what that's all about. But I have to think about it. it. Looks like it's coming from the head rather than blow by. Um, just in that one spot there. And um, cylinder number three. Should get this. Oops. Alright, we should be fine. Let's see. Okay, let's try it again. Don't want to drop this in the cylinder if I can help it. <laughs> okay, let's go back up to that interface and zoom around. Oh, a little bit too high. There's the interface there. Spin around, there's the valves. Not seeing any oil in that one. Again, if you could unlower the crosshatch pattern on the pistons, you know, the um, the rings for the pistons, it's it's starting to to, to set in as a new engine. It's still looking fairly fresh and cylinder number four if I can get in here so uh, let's say go back up at the top there we are spin around again see I don't know if you can see it there there's a little bit of what looks like shiny shiny oil and some crud Right, right there. I have to talk to an engine builder about that. If I can get a hold of Josh, ask him what he's thinking. Why would there be oil? It's also looking a little sooty. Um, ooh, look at that. There's the valves. Open. And uh, again, spinning around, trying to trying to find unhappiness. Oil. So. This is my technique, is go in, look in the cylinder and see if you can see where there's any oil coming from. And 
kind of call it a day. I'll take a few pictures of this, send it to the engine builder and see what he has to say. But the cylinder walls themselves look good. It's just the um, there's a little bit of oil in the um, actual combustion chamber in the top end there, which you've got to understand a bit better. And this is the dead uh, alternator. You can see the um, this the, the rotor looks clean, but the um, stator is just all baked. So something bad happened here. I have to figure out whether it was my circuit that provides 14.4 volts when the thing's only actually putting 13.8 out. Whether this is a bad alternator, I'm not sure, but this is a disaster here. I have to dig further into this. So this is the alternator I've just ordered. It's um, nice. It's a power master, and you can um, basically go and adjust the output voltage. So I don't want to overcook my expensive lithium iron phosphate battery, so I can set this at 13.8 volts, and it's a 75 amps, like what they call a mini Denso, with the same uh, size as my existing alternator. So got that in order. Get it up uh, and running early next week. Uh, another thing, I was turning off the excite voltage on the other alternator um, uh, above 80% throttle uh, just to cut any drag on the motor and um, this is somewhat similar, it's got a pin on it that um, if you uh, ground it, it'll drop the output voltage one and a quarter volts which is going to dramatically reduce uh, any, any uh, load that it's taking on the system. Okay, so there's the data. Um, using a brake specific fuel consumption of 0.42 for a race engine and this is pretty much a full race engine um, you're getting 260 horsepower at 7250 rpm and uh, that's what the chart looks like so it's a um, very very flat torque curve um, and anybody else that's used these um, tectonics 288 solid lifter cams you know Obviously, the intake system is going to change how the high RPM performance is, but they all have this really interesting, very, very soft low end until you get to um, uh, 3200 RPM, and then there's a little bump, and then it drops me off for about 1500 RPM, and then it comes right back up at just at 4750, and then it's flat all the way up. So, um, power peak at 7250 RPM, and um, if you shift at 6% above your horsepower peak, that puts it about 70, 700 RPM would be my shift point um, to maximize acceleration and quarter mile performance, that kind of thing. So um, obviously I've got to verify this with um, acceleration uh, testing. That's my preferred method of doing it, which is to use accelerometers and then you know the weight of the vehicle and um, you can then determine using basic physics what the uh, what the power required is to uh, accelerate that vehicle you have to do um, um, coast down measurements um, to uh, subtract out the wind resistance and then the net number you add that back in and then that's the uh, the net number that you then use so I've done this many many times you, I will also put it on the dyno at some point but uh, it's pretty good and then also I'll have acceleration and quarter mile times which will be uh, pretty good indicators of what uh, what kind of power the thing's putting out? So, anyway, super happy. Love that torque curve. It's uh, gorgeous.